My very special guest today is an Australian icon, a dinky dye, beauty bottler, bonza grouse, all round top bloke, and true blue troubadour to boot. Wow. The quintessential Aussie bush balladeer. Oh, and he can sing a bit too. It's a big city. Welcome to John Williamson. Hi, Mark. Nice to be here. John, I mentioned in the introduction, True Blue, you're very passionate about the Australian language. Do you think our uniquely Australian language is dying? Uh, well, not if you get around the bush, it's certainly not. No, it's changing. But um, no, I think uh, as long as we keep in contact with uh, with the bush, because, you know, if we if we stay in, you know, Dixon Street or something, you know, in Sydney or, you know, or in the eastern suburbs, it probably will get lost. But I think as long as uh, Aussies get around, and we are nomads, we get around a lot. You find, uh, you know, Victorians in Alice Springs, you find uh, people from Darwin in Victoria. You know, people get around a lot in Australia, I reckon, more than most countries. So I, I think that'll keep, uh, as long as we, we're living in the bush at some time, I think it'll it'll keep our fairly Aussie sort of style happening, I'm, I'm sure of it. They're obviously finding it pretty unique overseas at the moment with where the bloody hell are you? Yeah. Oh, it's a good idea. I think it's, uh, it's very strange that the, that the English would object to that. I mean, they come up with the most raw television shows you'd ever see. And now the Canadians are worried about the word hell. Oh, really? Yeah, that was in this morning. There it Tell is. me, the ochre, does he really exist anymore? Well, um, yeah, of course. There are, I, I suppose ochre describes someone who's almost an exaggerated Australian, but you know, I, I don't think we have to describe it as ochre. I think the word ochre is almost um, being embarrassed about our accent. I don't, I don't think we have to be embarrassed about it at all. We should be very proud of it. What do you like about the accent so much? Oh, it's just ours, you know. I, I'm, it's very unique. You know, I think we often tend to forget that uh, we're, how, how few people there are that are really are Australian, you know, in the way they sound. And, and for instance, how many people actually live in the bush? You know, there's probably only a, maybe a million people. So that's a million people who are actually bush people in Australia, in the world. And they're very unique, so I think we should be proud of anything that is uniquely ours. You've been a huge voice for the man on the land for many, many years. Do you think city folk have any really real idea of what it's like to live in the bush? Oh, I think uh, since that, you know, way back when we had farm aid, I think that, that was a bit of a turning point. I know a lot of bush people um, imagine that uh, we don't care about, or the city people don't care about what's going on out there. But I um, mean, but on on the on the other hand. The bush people probably don't care about the factory workers either. You know, it goes both ways. But um, I, I think we have. I think there there has been a, a lot more togetherness ever since that farm aid thing happened. And now, with uh, it just recently, we've had the had the disaster up at Innisfail. I I think that's going to bring us even more together. So, um, and I, I, you know, well, yeah, I think I think it's uh, people are aware of what's going on. Not everybody, but I think the, it's not like the old days. The media makes a lot of fuss about phrases they jump on. There's uh, sea change and now tree change. Do you think it's a real thing that's happening? Uh, well, I, I think it's a good thing if it is because, uh, you know, one of the biggest problems is, is uh, too many people living on the coast and in the, in the big cities. It cre creates a lot of, uh, you know, we're going to end up flooding more country with dams to, to make, so they can live there, you know. Uh, I think that the more we can do to uh, disperse the population... Um, decentralise, uh, I think the better. So if, if people get out in the bush, and it was recently some someone said that there are a lot more happier people in the bush than there are in the city, so there must be something good about it. We've talked about the country, now let's talk about your music, country music. Your new album's approaching 70,000 sales. How did you come up with the title, Chandelier of Stars? Uh, well, that's pretty obvious, I guess. If, if you go out into the outback and walk away from the campfire at night and when there's no clouds, well, uh, the stars, are th there's just more stars than you ever imagined. It's almost uh, white with stars, you know. And But but I actually come up with that line just before sunup. There's a, that period of time where there's only a few stars left and sometimes the, the sky is so clear that these stars are almost hanging in front of you like a chandelier, almost like you grab hold of them. In fact, I remember when I was driving the tractor years ago, I thought I was being followed by a UFO or something, and it happened to be Venus. It was just so bright and big, you know. You mentioned in some of the cover notes that uh, your final inspiration for it was when you were in Derby, is that right? Oh, for the song, yeah. Well, I had that line in my head for years, but, um, well, yeah, I was, I was sitting on a, on a like an old-fashioned shearer's cot in a bed in, a, in, a, in the Spinifex Hotel, and that was the deluxe room. 
the boys, they reckon they were lucky to get a room at all. And uh, I was a bit bit disappointed in the venue that they'd put us in. It turned out pretty good. We had a good night and a finish and all that, all that, having a drink in the bar with everybody. And But uh, I guess that, at those times is when you start to feel what are you doing out here, you know, away from home and away from your family and wife and all the rest of it. So uh, that's when these lines came too. So actually I had two bad nights on the trip and I ended up writing two good songs. So, you know, I always look on the bright side, eh? I know what you're talking about because I flew down from uh, the uh, top right to Broome and stopped at Derby on the way just at sunset. It's one of the most amazing sunsets I've ever seen in my life. Oh, yeah, it's a lovely area. I, the Kimberley's just amazing. You know, well, the boab trees are what get to me. Yeah, yeah, just a complete view, isn't it? Mm. Little Girl from the Dry Land, these are very personal lyrics. Mm. It's track one on the CD. It's about the difficult childhood of your wife, Mary Kay. Is it hard to expose such personal painful memories? Uh, well, I, I made sure she was cool with it. Um, and her dad was always open about his alcoholism. He, he started AA in Gundwindi when, in fact, he didn't. We, we reckon in the finish he hadn't really given up the grog at all, so he was a bit of an old con artist, old George. A lovely old fellow, really. But um, like many people who came back from, uh, from, from the war, they hit the bottle when they came home. He got the soldier settlers block out there at... Uh, on the Taluna Plain, anyone that lives out that way will know what I'm talking about. It's between halfway between Moree and Gundawindi, basically, west of the highway. No trees. And, uh, well, you can imagine Mary Kay doesn't have fond memories of the bush. You know, that wasn't a very romantic place to live. It was uh, very dusty and isolated. They did uh, correspondence at one stage. And she, I often remember her telling me that uh, if the insurance agent came out or something, that's about the only visitors they got. <laughs> Uh, they'd hide under their mum's dress. They were that shy from people, you know. So uh, it was more about that as much, you know, as much as anything, just the isolation. And uh, she, uh, she's no longer a bush girl. She'd much rather live in the city. Much rather go to go overseas on holidays and all the rest of it. Like like a lot of people, making I guess. up for lost time. How did you meet her? Oh, well, I actually met her on the land uh, property next door. Uh, uh, they had a Christmas Eve party, 1969. And she'd only just come back from boarding school, and uh, there she was, standing by a tank stand, very unromantic, but uh, she, a very beautiful girl. And uh, I was uh, I was a few years older, and uh, that's what happened. It was Christmas Eve on the neighbouring neighbouring property. They always had the Christmas Eve party, so I'd probably she'd probably been running around the lawn as one of the kids for years, and I didn't even know. So, uh, is this the first song you've written about her? No, no. No, I've uh, been lots of songs, yeah. You and My Guitar is probably the most uh, well-known about the battle I've had, you know, between uh, my two favourite ladies. They're both shaped like this. <laughs> How do you uh, write the songs? Do you come up with the lyrics first, then the melody? Yeah, not most of the time I do, Mark, yeah. Because uh, the lyric, a lyric to me, I'm more about lyrics than I am melody, so I, I always want to write a melody that that fits the lyric, you know, in mood and in rhythm and etc. So it's got to sell the lyrics rather than, you know, it, it astounds me here, like in the old musical days, uh, it generally was a lovely melody was written and then the lyricist came in to try and fit something to it, mm. which is a difficult job, I think, you know. Uh, I mean, I can do it, but I don't think the lyrics are ever as good. They tend to be, don't come out naturally, you know. When do you write? Anytime, anytime at all. But probably more when I'm relaxed. Uh, I certainly write a lot when I'm driving around the country. And I'm a relaxed driver. I, I guess it comes from uh, driving tractors for, for 10 hours at a time that um, I get quite comfortable driving on the road. And um, that's when you start to get into your brain. One of the songs on the album is The Camel Boy, which you wrote about the Aboriginal painter Albert Namanjira, who you nominate as one of your top 10 Australian heroes. Why is that? Uh, well, he's a genius as far as um, painting. He's a watercolourist. And I really believe that he was the one that showed us the true colours of the centre. Whereas uh, people like Sidney Nolan and Drysdale and those sort of people, whenever they painted the outback, it was about misery and heat and loneliness and virtually our, our unattachment to the centre, um, our fear of it, I think. you know, They used to paint you know, skeletons of dead animals and all this sort of stuff, whereas... When you see Albert's paintings, he's painting paradise, and that's what he's that's what he saw, and that was his home. And I think we're starting to see it ourselves now. Who are some of your other great Aussie heroes? If he's in the top ten, who are some of the others? Oh well, Don Bradman would have to be in there because he looked after his legend. Uh, uh, May Gibbs, 
who was a great artist, he's a Sydney lady that uh, really captured a gum leaf, you know. And, and you've, you've, I've dabbled in art, and to capture the real spirit of a gum leaf is not that easy. But she also made, wrote uh, great kids' books and, and I think romanticised our bush for, before anyone else did, especially with the gum nuts. And um, I think she was away ahead of time, you know. Like uh, There seemed to be a period after that that we lost contact with the bush. We're coming back to it now. You've also released a DVD of Chandelier of Stars and you mentioned on the DVD that country music in the States might be losing its way. How is Australian country music different? How is it maintaining the course? Well, it has so far, and it mainly because uh, we have, you know, it's important that we, we recognise the foundations of our music, and that, that is that the original balladeer stuff that came through from Banjo Patterson, Henry Lawson. People like Slim, Dusty, Stan Costa, Buddy Williams were all huge fans of Henry Lawson and Banjo Patterson, and, uh, and that was the style that they wrote. So it sort of came from that with music. So that's why I value Waltz and Matilda so much. It is our foundation song, I think. It's about our bush, it's about our battlers, it's about um, the underdog and about freedom, you know. And, and I think uh, as long as we keep contact with that music, and I always tend to write at least one or two tracks on every album, we can't lose our way. Um, you know, If we do lose contact, well, then the tree will fall over and we won't have an industry. On the DVD, there's an Aboriginal version of Walsing Matilda. How did that one come about? By Trevor, yeah. Um, Trevor Adamson. Trevor Adamson, yeah. Well, we were out there, um, it was the idea of... Uh, well, I think it's it's a government group. Um, I think they call it just put together for New Year, for Australia Day. It's Australia Day committee. That's right. They wanted us out there on the dawn of Australia Day at Uluru. Uluru, of course, is the area, not just the rock. And uh, and of course, had to be with the permission of the local mob there. And uh, Trevor is from that mob, and he told us that oh, he can sing Waltz and Matilda in language. And I thought that's fantastic because I. I never realised that could happen. So I sang my version of it and he sang his version of it, if I remember rightly, and uh, it was a real thrill to hear him, and it was cute as well. And uh, and, and it was very apt for, because it was all about togetherness. On that day we had a, a representative of the Afghans bring in a, a, a water barrel that used to hang on the camels in the old days. We had station people bringing a saddle in. Steve Waugh was there, he put a bat into the centre. Um, because that obviously brings people together, sport. And, of course, there was the music. Warren Williams and I sang Raining on the Rock together. And then Trevor sang uh, Walsh Matilda. And uh, it was a really nice day and a nice gesture, And I, especially on the behalf of the Aborigines, who in some cases believe it was the Invasion Day. So, um, you know, I think it's all a good sign. It is a fantastic version of Walsh Matilda. Let's have a listen to it right now. Water mounted on his thoroughbred. Up came the troopers, one, two, three. Who's the jolly chum buck you've got in your tucker bag? You'll come a waltzing Matilda. Sing it, everybody, now. Waltzing Matilda, waltzing Matilda. Ding, 
sing my tail down, won't sing my tail down. You'll climb a wall, sing my tail down with me, and his ghost may be heard as you pass by the billabong. You'll climb a wall, sing my tail down with me. Last chance, figure it out. Wall, sing my tail down. Wall, sing my tail down. You'll come a wall, sing my tail down with me. And his ghost may be heard as you pass by that billabong. You'll come a wall, sing my tail down with me. Coming back to the album Chandelier of Stars, tell me about Warren Williams and the song Keeper of the Stones. Yeah, well, um, Warren uh, is from the Western Aranda mob. He's, he, he's, in fact, Albert Namajira's great nephew. So that's how I was able to find out a bit more about Albert for the song Camel Boy. He told me that Albert was a camel boy at one stage, or regarded as such. But uh, Warren rang me uh, back in 96 with the idea that I would record, re-record my song, Old Ma- uh, sorry, Raining on the Rock, with him. And it mentions Albert Namajira too. It was all a, quite a coincidence. And I, I was wrapped in the idea, you know, because I, I've always really wanted to have a friend amongst uh, amongst a mob that still has a connection with the land, which the around Hermansburg they do, the, the Hermansburg mission of uh, handed it back. And uh, But Warren, uh, like most young Aborigines, have, have gone through... That, that whole lack of respect for themselves, which we took away from them generations ago. and uh, But recently he, he's become a keeper of the stones on his mother's side, which is a, quite an important role. It's, it's like the lawyer of his mob. And uh, those those stones hold secrets and messages and stories, stories from generations back, a thousand generations possibly. And I'm not allowed to see them because I'm not, not initiated. But... Uh, but I wrote the song about Warren and what he's been through with the petrol and the grog and all that. He admits he's quite open about that whole thing. In fact, he's now becoming quite a part in uh, helping the other kids get through that out in, the, out in those areas. But uh, but it's not just about him, of course. Uh, the first verse, I, I say, if you take me from my land, you leave me with no soul. Well, I feel exactly the same way. I feel uh, as attached to the land as he does, I think. And um, but, uh, but I dedicate the song to all those who have been through what he's been through. You know. Do you reckon our Indigenous people are getting a fair go? Uh, that's a tough one because it's, a lot of it's got to be up to them. You know, I think we, we in our ignorance a lot of times are doing our best, I think, to, to give them the opportunity to come out of themselves. But when, when there is that lack of respect, until that comes back, it's a bit of a vicious circle. You know, so... Uh, I think we can do more, but it's not as though we haven't been trying, I believe. It's often maybe not the right direction, but that's often in hindsight. But, uh, but you know, you know the way Warren has come good just through touring with me, the way he's come out of his shyness and so much more confident now, it can often come down to just helping people on an individual basis, you know. You co-wrote the song Desert Child with Warren and sing the duet on the CD. That's a rather unique collaboration for you, John. Yeah, well, we... We've discovered with um, two or three other songs before that uh, he's got a very high husky voice, and I can't sing in, in, on his in his octave. So I tend to, in the chorus, to sing an octave below him, which is really in unison, and it's become quite a unique sound, I think. And uh, I'm I'm so pleased with it actually that I we we determined to put a whole album together that with the two of us using that as a as a kind of a one voice, and uh, I guess it's got a nice message too. What's your personal favourite on Chandelier Stars? Uh, good question. Probably Camel Boy because uh, it not only says something about how how we mistreated Albert, and we've got to we've got to come out of that, admit it, and then come out of it because he was um, he was the first bloke to be able to come, the first Aboriginal to be allowed to become a citizen in Alice Springs, and then he was allowed to buy a house. His family wasn't allowed in the house because they weren't citizens. A lot of shameful stuff there, but. Um, but it's also, uh, I have a little dig about the Republic there because I say, you know, they dressed him up in a white suit to visit, visit the Queen and I don't think he was all that impressed about that idea, but he did it. He was a very gracious man. He was really was a, a reconciliator. He was a good, he wanted us to come together. Um, 
so the song is also about taking down the Queen's picture and putting up a landscape of Albert Namajira. So it's quite a Republican statement. I was uh, enjoying researching this and listening to the album and then watching the DVD as well. And it came to me an idea. What about a John Williamson karaoke DVD? <laughs> oh, well, it's not a new idea. That that has been... Th every uh, song we, we record, we uh, we record, we mix off a backing track just for that purpose in case it, it does come about. But, um, yeah, I, I suppose there are enough sing-along tracks on my amongst my 300-odd songs. We could probably make a karaoke, but uh, how many people would, would actually put the coin in the slot for my songs, I don't know. Well, going by the sales of Chandelier of Stars, it sounds like a fair few, John. You wrote in the cover notes, at this stage of my career, I feel I am at the crossroads. Is it all that I can do, or will this be the last time? Well, your response will help me choose which road I take from this junction. Since then, you've won three golden guitars at the 2006 Tamworth Country Music Festival, including Album of the Year for Chandelier of Stars, Highest Selling Album for Chandelier of Stars, and Bush Ballad of the Year for Bells in a Bushman's Ear. You're approaching 70,000 in sales. Have you decided which road to take? <laughs> well, I think I'm on the right track, but it sounds like so I'll, I'll go straight through the junction. Um, and I was fair dinkum when I said that because I, I guess, you know, after 36 years in the business, I've just turned 60, I've, I started wondering whether I'll wind down and, you know, I have other interests, you know, and uh, and, uh, and really if, if I'd been discouraged with, with the response to this album, then I would have been a bit lost to know where I'm going. But uh, I, I think this album is definitely the direction I want to keep going. I hope I can keep improving on that now because you never stop improving if, you've, if you're keen to do it. I'll, and I'll never stop running out of songs if I'm prepared to go out there looking for them. John, thanks for talking to me today. And before you go, could you please do us the honour of playing us a song from Chandelier of Stars? All right. Thank you. Nice to talk to you, Mark. Well, this is the song I've dedicated to uh, the balladeers in country music. It's called Bells in the Bushman's Ear. <laughs> Don't knock the old hillbillies, people love them out in the bush Simple tunes with words that you can hear You don't need complications where hearts are kind and true Just words that ring like bells in the bushman's ear Maybe you need to stroll down a little dirt track Slow down a walk in time with a drover Hear the wind play a tune on the cypress pine You don't need beer and you don't need wine Just words that ring like bells in a bushman's ear Like the hovering kite that whistles Telephone wires that hum Thunderstorms that rumble loud and clear He smells the rain that's coming Hear the cocky screech and yell Words that ring like bells in a bushman's ear Maybe you need to stroll down a little dirt track Slow down a walk in time with a drover Rattle an enamel mug with a spoon Talk to your dog or talk to the moon With words that ring like bells in a bushman's ear Yeah, rattle an enamel mug with a spoon Throw him a bone and make him swoon Words that ring like bells in a bushman's ear No, don't knock the old hillbillies People love them out in the bush A campfire is no place for rock and roll Proof is in the pudding They don't come and go Images embedded in your soul Maybe you need to stroll down a little dirt track Slow down a walk in time with a drover And when it rains you run amok Dance on the back of a cattle truck, yeah, words that ring like bells in the bushman's ear. Peaches swimming inside a tin, mutton chops that grease your chin, words that ring like bells in the bushman's ear. Words that ring like bells in the bushman's ear.